Uh, so a very very good evening to all of you, and uh, maybe a good midnight if you are in India. Uh, so this is Kushal uh, from from Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, and I am uh, truly thankful to Professor Bala, Sepide, Tulsi, and all the other members of uh, the Sadguru Center for a Conscious Planet at uh, at BIDMC Harvard uh, for kindly giving me this opportunity to present my work and interact with all of you. Uh, so please feel free to pitch in if you have any questions. I would like this to be an interactive session because I think that way the learning and the uh, you know flow of ideas is always uh, better. So the primary topic of uh, discussion today is uh, this question that can a purely physical system be conscious and this presentation which I'm going to make is uh, based on this paper of ours uh, which was published this year in uh, the uh, the Journal of Consciousness Studies. So this work uh, was done with my co-author Catherine, uh, who is based in London. Uh, interestingly, she is uh, my first co-author, whom I have never met or even had a Zoom call. All our interactions uh, were done uh, using email only. Uh, so I got to meet her on an international uh, group of scientists, uh, which is dedicated to discussing how science and consciousness uh, can come together. And in this, uh, we have presented a mathematical reasoning to answer some questions regarding the hard problem of consciousness, which I will present briefly in this talk. And I would like to just, uh, you know, give a, a, a you know, small emphasis on this idea that what we have done is kind of an informal proof, you know, so this is a mathematical idea, uh, but it is still informal because there are a lot of gaps which still need to be uh, filled, you know, it's not like a uh, completed study. This is, uh, you know, work in uh, progress. And the primary conclusion, uh, which is, uh, which can potentially be tested through physical experiments is what is highlighted in red, which is violation of energy conservation. So let's first begin by understanding what does this question even mean that when we say, okay, can a purely physical system be conscious? What exactly are we trying to ask? And why is this question important? So to understand that, let's take this uh, simple uh, diagram where you have a tree and you have a rope hanging from a tree and there is a person who is looking at this rope. So now I have enlarged the various parts of the body to emphasize on uh, what function each of them performs. So as we all, uh, as we all know, uh, you know, firstly, the uh, rays of light from the rope fall on the human eye which is then taken through some neurons, uh, which goes to the brain, lots of processing happens. And that then through some kind of magic leads to what is called conscious experience. So now this physical part of this process that the light traveling, the eye catching the light, uh, then, then that uh, going to the neurons and to the brain, that is all a part of the physical system, which is understandable. But what is not understandable, which is kind of a mystery, is conscious experience. So the question uh, that we are essentially asking is that, why is neural activity accompanied by conscious experience? And that is what is called the hard problem of consciousness. You know, this term was coined uh, many years back and there has been you know very intense debates which have been going on but as of now this is a unresolved question so now uh, you know the reason uh, this is unresolved is because you know largely it is addressed uh, using a philosophical framework where there are two camps literally who have very strong views uh, one can say is that, okay, consciousness is fundamental and everything has, uh, you know, come from there. So here you can take, let's say, the theory of Advaita, which says that consciousness is everything and, uh, you know, matter, energy, everything comes from consciousness. On the other hand is, uh, you know, let's say modern science, which says that physical matter is fundamental and consciousness and everything actually emerges out of uh, physical matter. Now, the problem with both these ideas is that they are not scientifically testable. You know, when we talk of science, when we talk of doing things objectively, 
we do not want to just put forth an idea and leave it hanging in the air. We actually want to test them scientifically. So these two, uh, uh, you know, uh, these two positions, they have been endlessly debated, uh, you know, since uh, many, many centuries, I would say. And within each position also, there are sub positions, uh, but they have mostly been led to unending debates, you know, which are use useful in the sense that they help in better understanding the questions, but they do not lead to a final resolution or a, a final answer, which can be scientifically tested and established as an objective truth. So that is where uh, neuroscience is going to play a very, very crucial role because over the last few decades, uh, for the first time, you know, because of technology, uh, mankind has had a chance to actually access properly, rigorously, the various neurons which form our brain, monitor its activity, and try to understand this mystery of conscious experience. However, there is a limitation in this process and the limitation is that what can be measured usually, at least currently, through this process of applying some electrodes on the brain is what is called neural correlates of consciousness. So even when, let's say, a neuroscientist says that they are studying consciousness, what they are actually studying is a neural correlate of consciousness. What does that mean? So let's say as I am giving this talk, let's say somebody puts a skull uh, you know, cap on my head and which has some electrodes through which some measurements are being taken. So what they will do is that they will measure my neural activity, let's say in the back of the brain, in the front of the brain, side of the brain, and then ask me various questions. Okay, how were you feeling when you did this? How were you feeling when you, when you did that? So through my responses, they will try to infer my state of consciousness, my conscious state, and then they will correlate that to the neural activity, which is captured uh, using these electrodes and try to find a correlation between the two. So this is kind of a indirect way of trying to understand consciousness. This is very useful in a certain way but it does not give us direct access to conscious behavior itself and it does not help in answering the question that why are these neural functions accompanied by conscious experience because uh, you know in science as you know you know there are there is a theory there is an experiment sometimes theory precedes experiment and sometimes experiment precedes theory. Uh, so neuroscience currently uh, in this approach is where the experiment is preceding uh, theory because you are doing experiments and then trying to infer uh, what might be happening. But when it comes to the heart problem of consciousness, uh, you know, there is a general uh, belief that you have to first have a theory which can then be tested using various neuroscientific or some other kind of uh, physical experiments. So now let's assume that, uh, you know, consciousness is physical, you know, as the question of the talk was, can a purely physical system be conscious? So now the approach that we are going to take is through this method of contradiction, that which says that you assume the proposition to be true, that you assume that consciousness is physical, then try to see where it leads you. And if it leads you to a contradiction, if it leads you to a logical contradiction, that means that your proposition was wrong to begin with. And that is the approach that we are going to take in our work. So now if consciousness is physical, or if it is emergent from a, a physical system, then it must be measurable. How to measure that? That comes later on. But first, we need to assert or assess whether this statement holds the test of logical scrutiny or not. So this is now the first idea that if consciousness is physical or if it is emergent from a physical system, then it must be measurable. 
so now when we talk of consciousness that actually comes in many many varieties and that is also one reason why studying consciousness is uh, so complicated so to make progress what we have done is that we have selected or chosen one feature of consciousness in this case it is called self certainty so basically basically what we assume is that that say that you have a device which can record the time that a conscious system is performing the self certainty function so what is the self certainty function it means that when the system asserts its own existence with certainty that is something that all human beings experience that i can assert my own existence now that may not be a general property of all conscious systems that we agree that that is a limitation but that is a good starting point you know when you have to solve a problem you have to start from somewhere and then keep adding more and more complications as you go along so we use a device so let's say such a device exists don't ask me how to make it because i don't know but let's assume that such a device exists using which we can record the time whenever the conscious system performs the self certainty function so the first assumption is that such a device exists the second assumption is that it only consists of physical processes because remember that we are assuming our proposition to be true that yes a physical system can indeed be conscious and then we will see that if we take this statement to its logical conclusion we arrive at a contradiction means it was wrong to begin with so the third assumption is that the conscious system can perform human like reasoning okay so if you take a bacteria or let's say a goat or a cow they may also be conscious but our proof our theorem does not apply to them so again we are narrowing the scope of our uh, theorem in order to make progress and once this is established uh, beyond reasonable doubt then we will add more and more layers of complication so that it is applicable in a more general setting so now let us come to the actual uh, you know mathematical ideas where uh, some more uh, you know thought is required so this is how we begin that you start with s of t which is your system under consideration okay so you have this human system uh, where you want to uh, figure out whether uh, the conscious experience can be emergent from the underlying physical uh, body or not and in order to do that we are now giving it certain definitions so we are saying that we have this function omega which needs to be performed okay so so if you see here uh, we have if for some value t where t is uh, some time the actual state of st is not null so what does that mean that when this system st which represents my human system when st is not null meaning when st is able to perform the self certainty function so when st is able to perform the self certainty function at that time this device will output 1 okay again how it is performing that function that is not our concern right now right now our concern is to figure out does such a function exist if yes can it be performed using a purely physical system okay so now in human experience we know that such a function can be performed because i know that right now let's say if you ask me perform the self certainty function i'll say yes i am sure of my own existence so i have performed the self certainty function so omega is 1 right now but what is not known is whether this function can be performed by the by a purely physical process so that is what we are uh, going to answer so in order to do that let's now assume that this capital x represents the set of processes which are needed to perform the self certainty function 
and how does it do it so now we need another function xi which figures out whether the set of processes in x are physically real or not so if the processes in x are real then the output of xi is 1 and it is undefined otherwise so now what will happen is that so now i know that i can perform omega and then i will go and figure out okay these are the set of processes which are helping me in perform omega and then i will go and check all of these processes and then if all of the processes are physical which means that they are physically real then this function xi will output one now here the issue is that okay we may say okay this function may exist i don't see a logical uh, problem building such a function implementing su such a function may be difficult but that's another matter but logically this seems okay that you know okay this function exists i don't see a problem but then the issue is that to demonstrate that the entire system is physical we have to show that this function xi is also performed by a set of physical processes okay so just to recap so that you understand this clearly we have the system s of t which and we need to perform this function omega which is one such that uh, uh, which is one when the state of st is not null and it is undefined otherwise there is a set of processes capital x which actually performs uh, the self certainty function now we need to check whether capital x is physical or not to check that we need to perform this function xi which is one if the processes in x are physical uh, are physical uh, or not so now in order to establish the physicality of the entire system we also need to establish the physicality of this function xi and for that we need to define another function xi prime which will take the processes which are performing xi and then check whether they are physical or not and that as you can see leads to this problem of infinite regress so to check whether omega is physical we need a function xi to check whether the processes which perform xi we need another function called xi prime then to check whether xi prime is physical or not we need another function called xi double prime and so on so now each of these functions can be performed at least theoretically speaking but to perform them would require an infinite set of functions which cannot be completed in a finite amount of time and that is why although the possibility of each individual function cannot be denied but collectively they cannot exist because they form an infinite regress so this idea is similar to this uh, you know uh, concept in pure mathematics about the truth value of a statement you know so when you let's say take a statement and give it to let's say a computer the computer can let's say output let's say 1 or 0 it is a binary function so it takes any statement and outputs 1 or 0 but this idea of assigning a truth value to 1 is a human cognitive function and it is not really possible to encode that in a computer so computer understands numbers but it does not really understand the concept of a truth value because that again requires an infinite regress and that is the main contradiction that we come across that we assume to begin with that my uh, purely physical system was conscious i said that okay i'm not going to worry about all the different uh, you know aspects of consciousness i will only worry about the concept of self certainty and now i want to perform self certainty i am a purely physical system and by following this logical uh, process what i have arrived at is that this physical process will require an infinite regress to perform the self certainty function and that is the logical contradiction which i have arrived at using which i am saying that okay that initial proposition itself must be wrong which means that 
a purely physical system cannot be conscious so this is a very you know a broad overview of the proof uh, you know those who are interested i would strongly recommend them to read the paper and then we can discuss uh, you know separately if you are interested so now basically uh, what we have shown through this informal proof again informal because there are still some gaps in the proof which need to be filled but still it is a, a you know good beginning point in some sense so what we have shown is that purely physical systems cannot perform the self certainty function but human beings do perform the self certainty function which is our uh, you know everyday experience so what that means is that human beings are not purely physical that there is an element of non physicality in the human existence what that non physical nature is that uh, we do not know uh, we need to figure out but at least the conclusion is that there is an element which is non physical in the human existence and this then implies that the human system must violate conservation of energy which is the primary testable principle as i said in the beginning our objective in this work is not to come up with another philosophical proposition which leads to another uh, set of endless debates but to come up with a conclusion which can actually be scientifically tested using uh, physical experiments so now the question is that how does this third statement uh, lead to this fourth statement so the idea is that in current physics when we say that something is physical it means that it can be described by using a hamiltonian and if your system is hamiltonian and if it is autonomous meaning that it is uh, you know time independent then it must uh, you know also have conservation of energy and now because we are saying that human beings are not purely physical which means they cannot be described by using uh, these uh, time independent hamiltonian systems then there must be some violation of energy conservation uh, so this may be a slightly technical uh, physics concept but from a you know more general perspective we can understand it in the following way that you have a purely physical system which has conservation of energy you have a non physical system which has a different kind of laws which we are not aware of now there is a interaction between this non physical consciousness and this physical matter and that interaction has to require transfer of energy so you need to sometimes give energy to your physical system and sometimes take away energy from it and that must then imply that there is a violation of energy conservation in the physical system so now this is the logical uh, sequence of ideas in the paper but actually for me you know when i started working on this it was exactly the reverse uh, you know uh, so i have been studying our vedantic scriptures for almost 20 years now and based on a lot of uh, you know such readings and discussions with lot of people who are uh, working in this area i sort of uh, realized that uh, you know if the human system is conscious which it is and if the vedantic scriptures are right then there must be a violation of energy conservation but just saying that is not enough one has to actually build a logical system to demonstrate the principle and the basic inspiration for uh, these ideas was uh, uh, was actually this uh, panchakosha model from the taittiriya upanishad it's a very beautiful model of uh, the human system so what it says is that the human system the human existence can be said to be divided into these five layers of existence so the first layer is the annamaya kosha which is the physical body my hands my hair my face my body and so on and so forth which we all can see visually that is the annamaya kosha which is made up of the food that we eat then there is the pranamaya kosha which is the energy body so when we talk of prana pranayam okay so en essentially we are energizing this energy body which essentially consists of the breath so this breath is what connects us uh, connects the physical layer which is the annamaya kosha and the non physical layers and that is why this breath is actually also given so much importance in our yoga pranayama and all these other uh, kinds of uh, practices 
So the non-physical layers are again divided into three categories. One is the Manomaya Kosha, one is the Vijnanamaya Kosha, one is the Anandamaya Kosha. Now, without getting into a lot of details, uh, you know, from a general perspective, Manomaya Kosha is the emotional body, Vijnanamaya Kosha is the wisdom body, and Anandamaya Kosha can be said to be the bliss body or the joy body or 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 some such uh, synonym. So the basic idea is that the human system is divided into uh, these five layers, and only the Annamaya Kosha is physical. Uh, you know, rest of these three layers are non-physical, and the Pranamaya Kosha is the connecting link between the two. Now, if we believe in this model, I don't know whether it is actually true or not, but if we believe in it, it means that there must be some energy transfer between the physical and the non-physical layers meaning that there must be violation of energy conservation in the physical layer. So this was the initial motivation uh, uh, for me. And then I, you know, worked hard with Catherine to build a, a, you know, logical mathematical system by which we can demonstrate the idea without having to rely on uh, scriptural knowledge. Uh, so now, uh, are we the only one who are talking about energy non-conservation? Thankfully, no. Uh, there was this paper which was uh, by an uh, interesting coincidence uh, put up on archive just this year uh, by Sean Carroll from Caltech, who is a highly respected cosmologist and his co-author Jackie uh, Lordman. So what they have uh, done is to study the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And what they say is that uh, there can be energy non-conservation when a measurement is made you know so when we talk of energy conservation in quantum mechanics that is only referring to the system between measurements but what sean claims is that when you make a measurement at that time your uh, violation of energy conservation can actually be large so they also propose an experiment but they themselves say that it is uh, you know not practically feasible I'm sure they are working on improving uh, the experiment to make it practically feasible. And I sincerely hope uh, that they succeed because it will truly be a, uh, you know, path breaking contribution uh, to physics. Uh, but if you ask me that uh, where uh, could we look for such energy conservation violations, my guess based on, uh, uh, you know, all the studies which I've done in physics is that uh, quantum tunneling is, uh, is a possible candidate because it is one of the most bizarre phenomena in physics, you know, quantum mechanics itself is bizarre and within quantum mechanics, quantum tunneling is, you know, even more bizarre. So, and, and there are other reasons uh, to believe that, uh, you know, there is possibility of energy conservation in this quantum tunneling experiment. But more interestingly, from a neuroscience perspective, because that is what, uh, you know, most of the audience perhaps uh, works on, is that uh, there is quantum tunneling in neurons. You know, there are several studies uh, which have been done, uh, which have demonstrated that uh, there is quantum tunneling in neurons. And so my uh, guess is that uh, this could be a good place to, uh, to look in. So now, uh, in case uh, for those who are not aware of what quantum tunneling is, so let me just give a very brief, uh, uh, you know, introduction. So now suppose you had uh, some kind of a wave, which had, let's say, some energy E, which met this potential barrier of some potential capital V. In the classical picture, you know, in the Newtonian classical picture, if the energy of this wave or, or, or of this particle, whatever you may consider, if that was less than the height of this potential energy barrier, then you will not be able to cross the barrier. Okay, so for example, when you take a wall and you throw a ball at the wall, so now you will always get the ball returned back to you because the wall is a rigid wall and the ball will come back to you in the classical world. But what quantum mechanics says is that that is true, the ball will come back to you, but with a certain probability. So what quantum mechanics says is that when you throw a ball at the wall, there is a very small, but a non-zero probability that it will actually go through. And that is very, very bizarre if you think about it, you know, because in our everyday experience, we see that the ball always comes back, but quantum mechanics says that no. 
that there is a very very tiny probability that it may actually go through and, and this quantum tunneling is at the heart of many other semiconductor devices and it has also been found to play important roles in several uh, important uh, biological functions and the reason uh, why quantum tunneling could be a good candidate for testing violation of energy conservation is that it is connected to what is called the energy time uncertainty relation in quantum mechanics so you might have heard of the heisenberg uncertainty principle which says that you cannot measure the position and momentum of a quantum system with absolute uh, precision simultaneously similarly there is a equivalent uh, uncertainty principle called the energy time uncertainty principle and what it says is that for very very short amounts of time there can be large uncertainties in the energy of a system now so far all the quantum experiments which have been done they seem to satisfy conservation of energy but perhaps there is a possibility to design a quantum experiment where one could actually measure the violation of uh, energy conservation so this is my uh, real hope uh, that uh, you know some day we will be able to come up with an experiment uh, to actually uh, demonstrate that there is possibility of energy conservation violation in physical systems in a scientific controlled uh, uh, manner and this was also my motivation to associate with the sadguru center and to interact with all of you that maybe through discussions uh, we can develop such a experiment which can then be performed to demonstrate the validity of the theory uh, so this is uh, uh, from my side finally i would like to thank uh, the sadguru center uh, once again professor bala sapide tulsi and all the other members of the sadguru center for giving me this opportunity and i must say that this center is uh doing an extremely good job and this is extremely important especially when we see lot of uh you know unpleasant things happening in the world around us uh, you know uh, such a center is very very crucial and it can play a very important role in uh developing the basic conscious level of behavior in all of us so with that thank you all once again for your kind patience uh, if you have any questions i will be more than happy to answer and interact Thank you very much Kuchal for this intriguing presentation. So if anybody has any questions please go ahead. You can unmute and if you'd like you can also um start your video and ask the question. Um Kuchal this is uh, Kashyap Kashyap Pathavada. We have uh interacted through the this yes, yes. Uh, Google group. Uh, Hello Kashyap how are you? i am i have still haven't understood the uh, um, the paper but anyway um i see the hang up is this infinite regress and um, so two questions why why is there infinite why can't i stop just at z there are many i have a set of processes which does this and why do i have to verify the, those that process a very very good question so first of all for the audience uh, kashyap has been a good friend for the last 2 3 years and uh, kashyap and katrin uh, we both of us met on the same group where uh, we had very very intense discussions uh, uh, on on all these topics and kashyap is a physicist uh, by training in the us he is a professor uh, over there uh, so so yes kashyap so we need an infinite regress because it is not sufficient to say that uh the process exists but we also need to establish that it is a physical process so currently this xi i am saying that okay this function xi exists which can perform this function but that is not sufficient i need to establish that xi also is physical to say that the entirety of this system conscious system is physical because otherwise there will be a gap we'll say that the system exists it can perform the six, uh, function but we will not know that it is a physical system so to establish that it becomes an infinite regress uh okay suppose i accept that 
And then uh, the next thing is that suppose you assume that energy is not conserved, uh, then it stops the infinite regress. Uh, so, so basically, uh, it stops the infinite regress because I stop answering, uh, because I stop asking whether it is a physical system or not. So now let's say if I, if I accept that this function Xi exists and I am not concerned whether Xi is physical or not, then there is no infinite regress. I do not need another Xi prime because then I'm not concerned how Xi is, is performed. The infinite regress comes because I am insisting that Xi must be physical, which has to be tested. So if I don't want to test it, if I say there is energy conservation violation, there is something non-physical, then I'm fine. That is, there is this function which is being performed. How it is being performed, I do not know. In some way, it is being performed. Okay, thanks. I will uh, look at the paper uh, again. Thanks. Sure, Kashyap. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anand is raising his hand. Hello, uh, thank you. Hey, Kushal, how are you? Uh, excellent, okay. excellent talk. <laughs> Thanks, Anand. Thank you so much. It's, it's so nice to get to interact with you here. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I have lots of questions, but essentially, so I'm not a physicist. So my questions are coming from my background as a neurologist. So I'm going to just make some observations and then like, I guess uh, you can kind of answer the gist of them. Uh, so one question is, what is uh, like through my understanding of your talk, it almost seems as though consciousness is something that you limit to kind of humans and organisms like that, which can make uh, kind of statements of self existence or whatever it is that you termed it right, as. Right. So then right. would that essentially, would the corollary be that, uh, like, shall we say, kind of quote unquote, lower forms of life, like uh, you know, bacteria or plants are not conscious and, you know, uh, would like a rock essentially be considered completely unconscious. And secondly, so if that be the case, what uh, um, is consciousness something that only certain things in the universe possess? And uh, so I guess one of the theories that I've read about is, uh, you know, this integrated information theory by Tononi. Uh, and the, the kind of the impression which may be mistaken that I formed from that was that consciousness is essentially a fundamental property of essentially everything. Uh, and that also seemed to me kind of the gist what I could get from things like Vedanta or Tantra, which is essentially that consciousness is fundamental to pretty much all of manifestation. And then that essentially uh, uh, other things are kind of overlays upon this underlying consciousness. So uh, and of course, thirdly, and maybe this is related to the previous two observation, uh, is there a distinction that you can make between like consciousness and life, for example, is like, is certain something is alive, does that also mean it's conscious or are they totally two separate things and life is not anything that we should be talking about or let, allowing us to confuse us? Right, Anand, very, very interesting question. Thanks a lot for, for bringing it up. Uh, so firstly, uh, we are not making any assertion about presence or absence of consciousness in other organisms. So if you ask me personally, I agree with you. I totally believe that, uh, you know, down to the lowest bacteria, there is consciousness. But with regard to this paper, we are limiting our study to those conscious systems which have the self-certainty property. So there may be other conscious systems which have other properties uh, or not, uh, we do not know. So, so we are not making any such statement about the presence or absence of consciousness in other systems. Uh, does that answer your first question? Uh, yes, for sure. So you're saying your paper is kind of taking a limited view and attempting yes. to answer a, a focused question. Okay. That yes, because uh, that is the only way to make progress because otherwise there are so many kinds of consciousness that, uh, you know, it's very easy to uh, get, uh, get uh, you know, totally confused. Uh, uh, so, so, so with regard to the Tononi's paper, yes, uh, we have a similar view. Uh, personally, uh, if you ask me, if you ask Catherine, she may have a different view, but I personally do agree that consciousness is a fundamental thing and it is not limited to human beings. But the question is now that how does this manifest in the human uh, system? 
and there the issue is that okay so now when we talk of bacteria or uh, you know other animals we say that they are consciousness because we are inferring it you know because we are biological they are biological all of us have come up through this process of evolution so because we are conscious we are inferring that they also must be conscious and now if you take this inference a little further we are inferring that even the rocks and stones may also have some very you know mundane level of consciousness because that is where everything has emerged however if you ask more directly the only thing we can be sure of is our own consciousness and frankly speaking so currently in the audience there are uh, you know certain number of people i cannot be sure of consciousness of even the other human beings in this audience because i am inferring that you are conscious because you look like me you talk like me you are a human being have a similar physical system and so you must have a conscious but actually if you ask me i cannot similarly for you you are sure only about your conscious experience you have no way of inferring or you have no way of stating absolutely that i am also conscious you can't do that you can do it only for yourself so that is the approach that we are taking so what is it that we are sure of let's begin from there and see where we get so we are sure of our own self certainty we are sure of of our powers of human like reasoning so that is where we start and we uh, proceed from there because that is the only aspect of consciousness we can be really be sure about everything else is an inference based on lot of assumptions which may be true which may not be true uh, does that make sense anand absolutely and i think yeah absolutely that's that's very helpful so essentially it's such a tough and wide subject that you're saying the only way to reasonably talk about it is to really narrow it down to things yes. like bite sized chunks excellent excellent i think yes. uh, that definitely uh, uh, answers a lot and uh, i guess um, so finally the question would uh, uh, essentially also be so uh, so in future could this be expanded like do you think that is something that is uh, 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 kind of in the pipeline uh, yes definitely this can be expanded in many directions but personally if you ask me my uh, uh, you know main focus now in this violation of energy conservation okay. i would really like to you know design an experiment in collaboration with neuroscientists physicists uh, whoever is interested in designing a scientific experiment to demonstrate this because you know philosophy has no end you know for 5000 years uh, you know we have been debating and we have made progress i am not denying that i am a fan of uh, philosophy also uh, but scientific progress can only be made when you demonstrate things using proper experiments you know otherwise uh, it it leads to uh, just debates uh, so personally if you ask me i am focused on uh, designing experiment on energy conservation violation but there could be many other directions uh, that one could take from here definitely correct thank you so much thank you anand thanks a lot it was a pleasure interacting hi kushal um thank you so much for your talk especially in the midnight of uh, at india i didn't <laughs> realize you. when we called you that it is going to be like 2am uh, uh, no no it's, it's absolutely okay not a problem <laughs> yeah thank you so much a fascinating talk um i have couple of questions right one is um one of the underpinnings in your theory is there is an experience that you are saying that may not just come out for example the vision part that you described and which is associated with an experience and that's what is the uh, process that spurs you to further questions so um what if i ask you that if that experience is also because of some neuronal system which is intact in the human brain and that thus you have an experience there so why should actually that lead to such a uh, theoretical explanation for it right uh, very very interesting so now uh, the idea so that is the idea of emergence of consciousness right that you have this uh, you know brain which has a certain neuron some functions are happening and because of some neural activity that conscious experience is emerging uh, have i understood you correctly yeah right so that is what we are demonstrating in this paper and saying that that conscious experience could not have emerged purely because of the physical activity of the neuron so the neuron 
could be like a trigger for you to have that conscious experience but it did not create that conscious experience so it is like uh, you know that there was uh, you know something already existing in a place and you could see it because some switch was flicked but the switch did not cause the existence of that object so let's say there is you are, you are sitting in a dark room everything is uh, switched off and there is some table in that room now when you switch on the light you are able to see that table okay so what the light did was made it possible for you to see the table but it did not create the table so now what our work says is that consciousness cannot be produced by a purely physical process that you cannot just take the physical process of the neurons and say that uh, consciousness is produced by it because it leads to a logical contradiction so consciousness is available in some form we don't know in what form it is the neurons are doing whatever they are doing so there is some kind of interaction which is happening between this non physical layer and the physical layer of neurons how that interaction is happening is something we currently do not understand and that is something that needs to be figured out okay so um we have other questions along those lines but we can talk about that later another way of measuring the energy violation right for example you attended programs uh, whether it's isha or anything else uh, for me it was all isha programs and there are countless states uh, examples of people who uh, were just sitting in art and without much of energy and once you get let's say initiated in some practice and you are like going on non stop with un you know uh, unending amount of energy for hours on end and where did that come from right suddenly um, all that happened was just uh, an initiation process in, right. in a matter of minutes you just transform to a different level of excitation and different level of energy yeah. which is there in many many people uh, yeah. it's just you are just visibly seeing that so where is that energy coming from can that be just an example of uh, your question that there is a violation of energy here absolutely professor bala absolutely so there are countless such examples which you have cited and there are also uh, reports uh, you know where people have lived for days all together without any morsel of food but they have experienced no loss of energy uh, so there are many such examples which clearly demonstrate that there is energy conservation violation however the limitation is in demonstrating that through a scientifically controlled experiment that is where the limitation comes so people who have undergone those uh, processes who have experienced that they know that uh, it is true but to establish that in a scientific way to to make the entire scientific community the mainstream community so let's say if we take uh, you know there are let's say 1 million scientists on this planet there is certainly a significant fraction which does uh, you know Uh, believe in these things it is aware of these things but it is not in the mainstream scientific community so here the challenge is to make it mainstream by a controlled scientific experiment so that is where the challenge is which uh, uh, which which i want to solve right so can't we start from there where like um, the only thing is do we have the tools to measure that and uh, if we have the tools to measure the transfer of energy or certain let's say that a person x goes from one state of energy to another can we demonstrate that then we have the settings where we can actually do these experiments and show and start from there and then we can go to the control situation so you're saying that how do we actually show it independent of the environment right that is the main challenge because biological systems are so complex that they have lot of exchange of energy with the environment they are all they are all open systems they are not closed systems so demonstrating violation of energy energy conservation will be difficult there but maybe if we brainstorm you know we may be able to come up with uh, a set of uh, you know uh, codes which can be applied uh, to actually do the testing uh, so it is difficult but uh, may still be possible and i think some brainstorming uh, may help once again thank you so much for your time and also it was a wonderful con- uh, talk and conversation that followed thank you Thanks a lot, Professor Bala. It was a great, great time interacting with you all. I think Akshat has Hi. another question. Hello, Akshat. Hi, yeah. Akshat. 
Hi, Dr. Shah. Thank you for that amazing presentation. Uh, just two quick questions. So Thank when you. we're thinking about things that are uh, necessary and sufficient for an effect, right? So the proof from your paper seems to suggest that just a purely physical system is not sufficient for conscious experience. But in terms of what we know from neurology, when people hurt themselves in their, uh, in the, hurt the nervous system, some parts of perception are affected. And which is why people think that when the whole thing shuts down, you'll have no experience and there will be no experience of the death. So what, what are the implications, if any, about um, if, if the physical system is uh, necessary for conscious experience? Right. Yeah. So that's a very, very interesting uh, question and very, very relevant question also uh, that, okay, that maybe, okay, even if we agree that a purely physical system cannot uh, cause consciousness, but is it at least necessary for conscious experience? So now that, uh, uh, you know, is outside the purview of this particular study because it is assuming the existence of a physical system, first of all. So it is saying that there is a human system which is available, which is having a conscious experience. And now we are asking that, is that conscious experience a result of purely physical processes happening in the body? And the answer we find is no, that there must be something which is non-physical to enable this conscious experience uh, from taking place. Uh, but what you're asking is a very relevant question. And uh, although it is outside the purview of this particular paper, but if you see again the you know the Vedantic studies or or what Sadhguru says and what other people like him says, they say that it is possible to have conscious experience outside of the human body. Now that again does not imply ex absence of physical matter, right? Because uh, because when you study uh, you know these people they talk of union with the universe and, you know, stuff like that. So there is still a physical existence, which is, uh, you know, accounted for. So now uh, when we talk of specific, specific case of, let's say, patients who are not dead, who are, let's say, in coma, who have uh, some brain trauma or something, and they are not uh, able to handle or they are not able to have a conscious experience, that is something is unanswerable because... As, as I mentioned in my answer to Anand that I can be sure of my conscious experience only. Whether you are having a conscious experience or not is something I can only infer based on a lot of assumptions which I'm making. So when a person is, let's say, in coma and according to us, that person does not have awareness, does not have any experience. But whether the person is actually having an experience or not is something we can never ever find out. Because consciousness is a purely subjective personal experience. So, so that's why whether when a person has some brain injury or some lack of consciousness, we are saying the consciousness is absent because we are making certain assumptions. And based on those assumptions, that person does not have consciousness. But beyond that, I cannot answer. You know, right now I'm talking to you. There is no way for you to tell whether I am having a conscious experience or not. You are, you are saying that because you are making assumptions. I am saying you are having experience because I am making assumptions. But directly, the only thing I can say is that I am having conscious experience. You can say you are having conscious experience. But beyond that, it's all a set of assumptions. So what I'm saying is that let me take myself I am sure of my physical body. I can see it. I am sure of my conscious experience because I can experience it. I don't need to ask anybody for that. I know I'm having it. Now, is this conscious experience caused by the physical body which I am having? And the answer is no. That's all that I'm sure of. That's all I can say. Beyond that, it's a long list of assumptions that we are making. Thank you very much. And uh, I just had one more quick question. So... If you're talking about energy transfer between something that's non-physical and something that's physical, generally when physical things transfer energy amongst each other, it's through forces that are well described in physics, right? like electromagnetism right. or gravity. So what speculation, so does this imply that there is a force or way of energy transfer that um, has not been described yet? Uh, so what this implies is that 
physics at the fundamental level will always be incomplete. So currently we have four forces. This does not mean there is a fifth force or a sixth force or a seventh force. What it means is that even if, let's say, after 100 years, scientists are able to find, let's say, 49 forces, for example. So even then, that set will always be incomplete. There will always be something else which will be interacting with this set of 49 forces to make conscious experience happen. So what this study suggests is not the existence of another a force, but the inherent incompleteness of physics, like, you know, Gorel's theorem was inherent incompleteness of mathematics, you know, that no matter what you do, mathematics will always be incomplete, you just cannot complete it. So that is what this study does for physics, that no matter what you do, no matter how many forces you find, at the fundamental level, it will always be incomplete. Because conscious experience, which is my truth, I know for sure it happens, cannot be described by a purely physical process. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Akshit, I want to add that um, there was a talk on mind and brain uh, between Sadhguru and uh, Stephen Lawrence. So, which actually discusses whether your question, the crux of your question is, is brain a window or is brain the origin of the con consciousness for it? And that was discussed there he talks about Lofton syndrome, patients with Lofton syndrome who are called comatose, but they have uh, come out of it. They have been like that for almost seven, eight years. And after that, they come out of it. And so they really I go at length to identify these patients and take care of them until they can come out of it. What they describe is they have been processing everything that has been happening around them, but there's no way they can respond to that stimulus. So neurologically, it seems like one uh, example is Lofton syndrome, where you can at least, from their own words, they can come out and describe some of these situations. So we really don't know where this is all going, but he has done some really seminal work in this area to talk about what distractions of brain and what levels of coma. And coma is just a, such a broad term that needs to be really broken down into multiple uh, stages or multiple, uh, should I say, classifications. So you might be, you might want to go back and look at that uh, recording. Thank you. And because they're comatose, they don't have the normal neural correlates of consciousness that you get when people are awake, but they still subjectively describe that they were having experience when they wake up. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you all so much um, for all these intriguing questions. Kushal, I have like 10 questions to ask you <laughs> right now, but in the interest of time, I think we need to um, close the session. But just um, just one okay. suggest or one um, something I wanted to uh, propose and, you know, an alternative to the idea of when you go through an initiation process, the energy um, conservation violation happens. The alternative may be that the energy is there it's the subtle energy and we may become more receptive to it right so it's maybe the transfer of the energy that's external and then becomes internal so that's another maybe way of absolutely no no so this is the same thing which we are also saying so so all that we are saying is that this subtle energy is not physical that's all okay, that's all that this subtle energy which is there which is coming into you is not there in the particles in the air. It is non-physical. It cannot be explained through any law of physics. Neither the laws that we know of, nor the laws which will be discovered ever in the future. So, so your, is, your assumption is that we will not be able to um, devise an experiment or a device to measure that, right? It should not be measurable then. Yes, which is our, uh, which is our logical conclusion. That is not our assumption. We made some simplifying assumptions and that is our conclusion that we arrived at. That you can experience uh, uh, the consciousness which you're experiencing, but you can never explain that by using any equation or any physical law. That is the conclusion that we arrive at. Okay. That's very interesting. I would definitely love to continue that conversation with you. Thanks, um, day. Looking forward yeah. to it. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining the session today. Uh, our next speaker series event will be uh, towards the end of September on the third or fourth week of September. Please uh, keep an eye for receiving an email. 
And if you would like to be added to our mailing list, please uh, send us an email at sadhgurucenter at bidnc.harvard.edu and we'll make sure to send you information about the speaker series and other events. Um, so hope you are all safe and well and hope to see you in our future events. Thank you all for Thank joining you. us. Thanks, Happy Day. Thanks, Professor Bala. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining. It was a great pleasure interacting with all of you. Thank you, Kushal. Thank you.